it was not it would not have been uh, possible without the help from Carnegie uh, funds. Uh, this Carnegie Bank they financed the first expedition of Adolf Bebek Nordenskjöld 150 years ago. So big, big thanks to them, and also big thanks to all the other sponsors for. Without clothes, we would have freeze to death, I promise. And without skis, we would still been standing in the north of Svalbard. Without tents, we'd been blown away. And all that, and also rifles to protect from polar bears. And finally, the Pfeiffer Beacon, which will host a, a photo exhibition that will be in Sweden and gone global this winter. So, who is this Erik Hus. I'm a Swedish uh, geographer, uh, educated in uh, Lund University, but they didn't have glaciology there. So I continued in Stockholm University, uh, studying glaciology and earth system science. Um, I also have a degree in journalism, so I was a scientific editor for the former biggest network of earth system scientists on the globe. Uh, international Geosphere Biosphere Program. Um, after that, I was head of media for the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. Maybe you heard about the Nobel Prizes in Physics, Chemistry and Economic Sciences. So, that was a lot of work with that, with the smartest persons on the earth. Uh, you had to really struggle to understand. Uh, I'm also a keen skier. I love skiing, it's my passion since I was a kid. So, protect our winters, I was uh, part of creating this in Sweden. Uh, it's a movement that mobilizes the whole ski uh, industry in the climate. Because if we get too warm climate, we won't have any skiing at all. And that program, you pick up trash while you jog, it has become the global environmental movement in Sweden all over. Who could believe that? We pick other trash and people love it. Uh, then I started my own company six, six years ago, Sustainability. It's about science, take science into business and so we can thrive, do business on the terms of the planet. And as a, um, a scientific, a scientific advisory board, I have the Berlin Center for Climate Research which I represent today, together with Researchers Desk, which is a network of researchers. So, the climate. Have anybody heard about the climate? Yes, I do. So, in one graph, you could see here, this is uh, when I was in Antarctica in the 90s. We did some uh, ice dynamic studies. The result of this resulted in a deep ice core 4,000 meters down and we came back 800,000 years back in time. And that is eight ice ages. And you see the, the temperature and carbon dioxide that follow each other. These are astronomical factors running the ice ages. But on top of that we have the greenhouse gases strengthening or weakening. Now you can see the carbon dioxide levels has been, you know, since four or five thousand years, it has been between 180 and 300 parts per million. When humans came in, we have increased that with 50%. And since carbon dioxide is such a long-lived gas, it lives for thousands of years. You can see that it's um, and 50% more. It represents. Uh, climate that is three degrees warmer and a three degree warmer world will be safe open space for maximum one billion people on, on this planet and we are heading to 10 billion. We might be 90% too many in just a couple of decades. So let's not go there, I'd say. So, topic of the day, expedition. I borrow a map from Otto Felix Nordenskjöld. He drew this map 150 years ago. I found it in an old library. And um, this is how it looks. Very powerful, polar explorer, honor and bravery. 
like it was at that time. Uh, they went on this ship, Polheim, uh, from Scandinavia up to to reach the North Pole. But it was too much ice at that time. Too much ice, so they, you see, it's a little from the, they started from Longyear Bean up to this little Mossel Bay in 1872, exactly 150 years old uh, ago, years ago, and trying to reach, but they were stuck in the ice for two years. So they took their skis and sledges and went over the Hinlopen Strait to the east, over to North Eastland, Nordausland, as they say in Norway. And they skied, it took months. And this is the largest glacier in the whole Europe. Not many people know that. And uh, we were planned to recreate this and see what has happened with the ice on the sea and in the mountains in 150 years to celebrate his bravery by the Jubilee Expedition. So, where is Svalbard? Well, it's a little... Svalbard is actually an archipelago. It's uh, the biggest island is Spitsbergen. And it's right between the northern tip of, of Norway and North Pole. So it's pretty far north, you could say. But, you know, global warming, you heard about that. The Hindopan Strait has been, you know, stuck with ice for thousands of years, but when we went there, it was too too uh, risky because it was moving and melting even in the middle of the winter. So we had to change route, and we could not start from the Mosul Bay and go over the strait. So we had to take help from from ski mobiles up to the starting point. So it took a whole day, 300 kilometers on a ski bill. And five minutes before we reached our goal, I recognized that they had hand warmers in the handlebars. I didn't know that <laughs> my hands were freezing. <laughs> Stupid me. Well, this is how it can look. It is enormous ice. It's 95% of small bodies covered with ice, you know, five, thousands of meters thick. And it's really, really, really beautiful when it's nice weather. Now, with so much more heat in the atmosphere, you have so much more moist and so much more bad weather. So normally May is like this, but we have maybe three days like this for a whole month. The route, route change number two. Uh, we came up to the Fulheim station where Nordersjön was situated for two years. That was the sea ice, and when there's sea ice, there are seals, and you know what eat seals? The biggest predator on this planet, the polar bear. And the polar bear doesn't fear anything. And it comes slowly, and the late last 50 meters, it rushes in seconds. And you are just a piece of smorgasbord, as you say in Sweden. So it was really bad weather coming for one week. So the guide said we had to go around the corner, uh, a peninsula, and then back again. Well, he, he, he's been working a lot in Svalbard. He said, no way I'm going in this bad weather. This is heaven for polar bears. We won't see it. We, won't, we will only see the two black dots of the ice when it's too late. And if you shoot a polar bear, you have to go to the police in prison immediately because they are uh, endangered species. You do not want to encounter polar bears. So we had to change the route, go south. But before we did, we actually looked at the shore. We found plastics in the northern part of Svalbard. We found this. It's not an animal. It's actually an old pine tree from uh, Canada. And we made some dating. It's over 5,000 years old. So halfway to the Holocene, this. And this is our guy, he's not that old, a bit younger. Really tough guy, Christy Jonsson. Yeah, he knew weapons from, from he's brought up in the northern Sweden. So he took, took care of us. 
And he sent me right in front of the little cabin for no the show. But we went south. But we, first day we went up on the glaciers. We thought, that, oh, normally on, on the summit of the glaciers there's no stable, this high uh, high pressure. But we had snowstorm for four days, minus 30 degrees, and storm winds. So the chill factor of between 40 and 50 degrees minus. So when you went out to do your thing, number two, in 30 seconds your hands were totally frozen. So we had to be really creative not to freeze delicate parts of your body. So it was a challenge, really challenging start of this expedition. But then finally it cleared up and we had to move because we didn't have enough food to stay for too long. So we started to move in with the GPS and altitude meters and watch out for, for crevasses. So you had to walk and hear, you hear the sound when you come to the And finally, there are two things. I've never, I've been working as a glacier glaciologist since the beginning of the 90s. And two things I've never seen in my life. First, we came around the corner, down the glacier, down to a really big glacier, down to the Hinlopen Strait. And there was supposed to be a lake, but there was no lake. We could just see a collapsed glacier. It was half a kilometer long, and the blocks were maybe 20 meters high. So probably there's been a called Jökulau. It's a kind of ice dam lake that just collapsed because of the rapid melting. So no, and as the glaciologist was talking about, nobody had ever seen this before. So this happened probably just before we came. The other thing was really sad. We actually had a moment, silent uh, minute, because I've seen retreating glaciers all over the world. But this, it's not a retreating glacier. It's a non-extinct glacier. The glacier is totally gone. And this is up in the Arctic, where it's supposed to be cold. So you can just see the lateral moraines, the terminal moraine, encompassing the area that once was a glacier. It's completely extinct. And that was really sad. I, I was actually crying when I saw this. I've never seen it before. Then, route change number three. Um, we're supposed to go down to Longyear Bay, all the way down. But we had reports from the satellite telephone. So they said, it's not possible. The, the rivers have broken loose, so you will be stranded somewhere. So we had to find an exit. So we find, with the help of researchers at Uppsala University, the uh, Norderskjöldbrean, named after Norderskjöld. So it was kind of a destiny to end up at Norderskjöldbrean. And while we were exiting that way down to the sea ice, there was, there was a big flood and suddenly there was a patch of Ligyakula above us. So we had to throw ourselves up on the side. I did, I did have time to take a photo by then. But, but all this was covered with, you know, flushing cold ice water. So these things can happen when it's this rapid melting. But finally we went down to the sea ice. So this is sea ice. And what you see is the front of Nordersjöldbrean. To the right, you see a terminal moraine. And I thought, well, this is the old terminal moraine. You can see a lot of gravel uh, on the lee side, on the south side, you can see a lot of vegetation. So this was the pro probably the 910 maximum limit of the glacier. And we see from above, you can see that the glaciers retreated three kilometers. One of the biggest glaciers in Sweden, Sturglasjärn, that's the whole length of this glacier that this has retreated. And this is one of the most stable glaciers on Svalbard. So a perspective of this is that, if we look at this map, this is the, we helped Uppsala University with the glaciological measurements of states and movements and accumulation and ablation on this. And we could see that it didn't melt so fast. So we thought, well, it's not so much melting that we thought. But when we look at the whole Svalbard, the whole group, if we compare to the world, 
For 120 years, the world has heated up 1.2 degrees, and already this is 170 times faster than normal variations, if we look back 3 million years. So it's, it's the speed of change that we all discuss here. But on small border, if we look from the 18th end of the 19th century until today, this is the temperature curve on small border. You can see that from the beginning of the 1970s, the latest 40 years, Svalbard has increased 1.25 degrees per decade. So that is seven times faster than the normal rate on this globe. So when I figured all this out, I realized we must act. So what does the oil companies do? Well, the coming three years, they're planning to expand their extraction of oil in the Arctic, which is super sensible, with 20%, with the help of our banks. French banks, European banks, Swedish banks. Swedish banks finance this with 45 billion Swedish crowns. They have a green outside, but inside is really, really, really dirty. So what you hear is just brainwashing. Don't believe when you talk. Check with the money flows and you see what's happening. And Gazprom is, of course, the biggest financer you know, from Russia. So we, when we came back uh, to Longyear Bay, normally there would be you know, snowmobiles all over you know, and, and snow. But they had, from one day to another, the snow just went away. And they were totally shocked. So when we came, there were snowmobiles all over. They didn't have time to move them back to the garage and in the, in the small uh, balconies where they had the snowmobiles. So it was a lot of small, lower snowmobiles. This was in the end of May. And before we actually ended our expedition, this is the end of our expedition with the moving assault in the hind, we said we must, we must do a statement with all our impressions. So we found this driftwood made a place for the smallest and northernmost climate summit in the world. And we made statements that will be presented in a movie that we will produce this, uh, this winter. And uh, there was a lot of things said, but what came to my mind is that, okay, don't leave any trash and take only photographs, but we can leave a positive footprint. And how do you leave a positive footprint? Where well, you talk about it, you learn, you, you, you discuss with people that, that maybe are not glassologists. What is happening? And how fast is happening? And uh, this is the filmmaker. He's, he's worked with David Attenborough, so he's pretty skilled, I promise. Really skilled. Abi uh, Rabelista. He's, he's uh, Philippine, half Philippine, half Dutch. He was sitting there. And we were discussing, so what is Svalbard? Svalbard is actually the canary bird of the globe. Because of what happens at Svalbard, if we know more what happens there, we know what will happen to the planet sooner or later, if we don't act. So we have a perfect, perfect help. Number four, right when we were going to be picked up at Cop Ekholm, the sea ice was just gone. In two days, the whole fjord has, was gone. So we had to jump inland and to get picked up. Luckily, we had this marine radio, so the guy could call a cruise ship. They could get us up. And on the cruise ship, there were beers and barbecue on the deck. And we had this dry food for a month. That was marvelous. So this is the last picture of the expedition and uh, I just want to thank you for all your attention. And this was very short, so maybe you have some anything, questions about blisters or glaciers or uh, anything, <laughs> the, the mood. This is your opportunity. Hi, thanks.